All right, one final lecture. It's been so long coming. Again, I, I sent out an announcement, but I'm sorry for the delays. This is part five and the final part of the lecture, the video lectures on uh, the formal evaluations of arguments, which is the formal logic section of our class. Um, yeah, my apologies for the, all the delays. I'm still feeling really sick, and it's it's been slow going. But what can you do? So. We'll keep trucking along. I've changed the schedule slightly, but it, it should all work out fine from here. Um, so we have one more thing we got to talk about. We got to talk about translations, which the book actually talks about as kind of the first step here of logical analysis. And even in my uh, lecture notes, uh, which I'm going to bring up here, when I talk about the procedure here for testing arguments for logical validity using this logical analysis, step one is to do the translation. And I've got this sort of procedure uh, laid out here. And then step two is doing the truth tables like we've already talked about. And step three is checking the truth table to see if the argument is valid. So this stuff we've covered pretty exhaustively to this point. And all we got to talk about now is this stuff. Now, um, before we get started with the details, the first thing I want to say is that um, the procedure here is a little more uh, fuzzy. Like, you might have been really enjoying how logic is extremely discreet and plays by rules with no exception cases and no judgment calls that really need to be made. You just have to crunch the truth values, um, and that's it. If you know your truth tables and you know the procedure here, parts to holes for calculating truth values for propositions, you're good. Just turn that crank and keep churning out truth tables. It's easy. Well, with translations, it's not going to be quite so easy or mechanical. And this will require a little more judgment call, but this is because of ambiguities that are in English and not of any ambiguities that happen in logic. And so uh, that's, that's really the game, is having to deal with the obnoxious things about English again uh, as we try to corral the logical meaning of what people are arguing in English. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, also point out is that um, when we're doing these translations into logical form, they don't... Oh, sorry about that, everyone. I got interrupted with what classroom I was commandeering to record this video lecture. Um, okay, so I was saying that the complexity here that's going to come into translations comes from dealing with English, but not from logic. And that's why I wanted to start with the understanding the logical symbol language a little bit better. And so we spent the last four lectures doing that first. So hopefully when we come here to now getting English meanings to fit with the logical symbol language, um, you know what you're dealing with now. You know what those logical operators are. You know when you're constructing a logical expression, a string of symbols, what it would actually represent. And that's pretty important because if you didn't know what the logical symbols that you were writing down actually represent, then all of your translations are like a huge guessing game. And who knows whether you're right or wrong. You won't be able to double check your own answers on the, on the exam or something like that. We don't want that. Um, I always, I, you know, I don't just want students to get good at guessing what a right answer is, but that they have understanding that you're putting that, under, that answer down knowing what you're doing and, and that you can be confident that your answer is correct because you understand it. So that's what we're, we're aiming for here and always uh, in, in this class. Um, so uh, I hope the order will kind of serve to that purpose. Um, and there's really, there's a lot of things that can show up with English that are strange. One thing that's important to remember is that logic doesn't capture everything that's a part of the meaning that we get with English. So one of the reasons why we might forgive English for being uh, a little clumsier is that it's aimed at doing a lot more than just making truth claims. There's a lot of information that is packed into, um, and, a, and just a lot of expression that's packed into natural languages that our logical symbol language just doesn't hope to capture. It's just trying to do one specific job. It's trying to look at truth claims and truth conditions and to see whether it's possible for the argument to be valid or not, whether it's possible to have all true premises and a false conclusion or not. That's it. It's only designed to handle that function. So there's a lot of meaning that will get cut off. This kind of is a, a familiar theme from the what you were doing for me in the previous unit before the exam, where you were reconstructing arguments into standard form. 
there were some things that were not relevant to the argument that might show up in the English, and you had to weed that stuff out. There's going to be some similar stuff here. There's also going to be some trickier cases for how to figure out what is the information that is being said in English. And that's actually my favorite metaphor for when you're approaching doing translations. You're trying to capture, so if there's all this stuff that you aren't going to be capturing with logic, what are you capturing? You're capturing the information in the claim, like what is being claimed to be true or false. What's the information the person is trying to convince you of believing? Or that's the content of their beliefs when they're laying out the premises and then the conclusion. That's what you're trying to capture, nothing more. Just that information. And you're trying to figure out the best way to capture that information using the logical symbols that we've got. Um, okay, so uh, the one final thing I want to say is a bit of preliminary here. Um, I'm going to be basically, the, the structure of this lecture will be looking at all the different logical operators and what kinds of English words and phrases that they translate, but then keeping our eyes peeled for uh, specific potential pitfalls, certain little mistakes in translation that are easy to make uh, that you have to make some judgment calls about, and I want to put that stuff on your radar, and the exam will specifically test you for these things and give you cases where you get to practice that kind of thing. But that's what we'll be doing. There's a, just a few things to mention with each of them. Um, and some of them are on themes that are already familiar from stuff I've touched on with the truth tables. Um, so let's first just review quickly the process though. Um, when you're doing a translation, the first thing you got to do is substitute propositional letters, that's what I mean by variables here, for the propositions expressed in the original argument's claims. Um, after you put it into standard form. So you do have to figure out you know, what's the conclusion and what are the premises first. Um, but then we've got to break it down into its symbols. Remember that all of these operators, all these operators are like compound expressions that are built out of simple component parts. And first we have to figure out what those simple component parts are. This is what I talked about in the first video lecture as um, the universe of discourse. Remember when we had S S stood for Miss Scarlet is the murderer, and C stood for Colonel Mustard is the murderer. We did that kind of thing. Um, identifying what those simple propositions are, that's always the first task. Some of the homework problems will uh, have you do that. They'll give you maybe the letters, but you've got to figure out what are the simple propositional claims that, are, that they're made of. On the exam, I'll actually always give you the universe of discourse, so you'll never have to engage in that guessing game. But we should probably do a little bit of it ourselves because this is what you'd have to do in the real world too. Uh, you'd have to kind of piece it together for yourself. So how would we do this? Well, remember, if we've got logical operators like all of uh, these things that let us make more complicated statements, ultimately a proposition, whether it's simple or complex, has a subject and it has a predicate. So you're looking for the most basic components here, the most basic claims. But there still has to be a subject and there still has to be a predicate. Um, there were uh, plenty of answers on the exams in the standard form section. And this happened on the uh, paper project too, where you're laying out the claims in standard form, but uh, the, the premises, or, the, or usually the premises, not the conclusion, but usually the premises could have had sentence fragments where it was just like a predicate or a subject, but not a full subject-predicate combo. And we need both of those to have a complete claim. Let me kind of show you what I mean. So this was something I was kind of talking about in the first video lecture, too. Remember <clears throat> when I made something like uh, S stood for um, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. Ooh, murderer. There, like that. This is a simple proposition because we've got uh, a, it's, a, it's a full proposition because we have a subject and we've got a predicate. Okay, subject and predicate. Great, that's what we, what we needed. Both of those things to have a complete claim. If we just had, um, here I'll do another thing here. <clears throat> if we just had is the murderer, that would make no sense whatsoever. 
if I just said that, I wouldn't have made a complete claim. I don't know, I can't tell whether this is true or false until I know what it's talking about. But likewise, if I identify the subject with no predicate, I also don't have a claim. I know what we're talking about, but I don't know what you're saying about it. Um, Miss Scarlet, uh, exists? That would even be maybe a, a predicate that could be evaluated. Um, but Miss Scarlet on its own is meaningless. So we need both of them together. Miss Scarlet is a murderer. That's the kind of thing that could be a full claim that could be true or false. Now, if we had like the first premise of that example I used in the first video, which looked like this, is saying Miss Scarlet or Colonel Mustard is a murderer. Well, that's a compound statement that's composed of simple parts. And you have to be looking for those most basic simple parts. If when you're calculating truth tables for expressions, the whole pattern was a matter of parts to wholes, like starting on the inside and working your way out, doing translations is the opposite of this. The whole method for translations will be you need to figure out what's going on with the whole and then break it down into its parts. And that's the method that you'll kind of see me demonstrate here with a few problems as we go through it. Um, and I will do some example problems here. But before we, before we get to the example problems, let's talk about all those little idiosyncrasies that we need to be keeping an eye out for when it comes to putting these simple propositions into more complex propositions. And even if that is even something we have to do at all. Um, the first operator that will... Ooh, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> There we go. Boop. First operator we're going to talk about is just our first one. I'm just going to go down the list here. Conjunction, disjunction, conditional, biconditional, negation. So with conjunction, with the and statement, the this is what the book is talking about as um, do, 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 uh, non-propositional conjunctions. Okay, So these are cases of the English word and that cannot be translated into P and Q because it doesn't have this kind of truth structure to it. So are these truth conditions. So let's do an example here. Um, if we did this, uh, Tim and Ludwig did their taxes if you got this English sentence and you're being asked to put it into uh, a logical translation into logical symbol language, our propositional logical form, then you might be inclined to think of this statement as basically equivalent to saying Tim did his taxes and Ludwig did his taxes. When we say Tim and Ludwig did their taxes, we're saying basically you're getting two different pieces of information this piece of information and this piece of information. And hey, these things kind of sit on their own as um, individual uh, claims. You know, again, you can kind of, uh, you can think about, here, let's do this again. You can think about um, whether Ludwig did his taxes, that being true or false, and whether Tim did his taxes. It's got a subject and a predicate. Tim, and what did he do? He did his taxes. Ludwig, what are we saying about him? That he did his taxes. All right. So we got two nice uh, independent claims here. So we might have our universe of discourse look like this. Uh, Tim's T is going to stand for Tim did his taxes. And we'll have L stand for Ludwig did his taxes. All right, sweet. Looks like we can do this. And then, if we are going to translate it, we're going to give an answer for how to translate the original utterance here. Then we might just translate it as T and L, where T and L stand for these simple propositions. This claim right here is translatable this way. And I think that's the right answer in this case. Okay, so if it was Tim and Lewood did their taxes, we needed to put this into logical form. This is pretty good. You want to use the ampersand for those cases where you're being given two pieces of information. When they're like, here's something and here's something else that's true. Then the and is totally appropriate. But sometimes there's cases of the use of English and where that's not happening. 
So let's let's look at an example here. So again, Tim and Ludwig, that's how we're going to start here. Let's look at that. What if the sentence was, Tim and Ludwig played chess? Now you might try to break this up again. And you might try to make it like T. Tim played chess. L. Ludwig played chess. And then we might want to have our answer look like T and L. But this won't do. Because this way of capturing or presenting what's the information that this sentence is giving us is inadequate. It's insufficient. Um, when someone tells you Tim and Ludwig played chess, I don't think that they're just telling you that Tim played chess and separately and independently Ludwig played chess. I think the implication here is that Tim and Ludwig played chess together, that they played against each other. Um, they played a game together. It's not just that Tim was involved in the activity of playing chess and Ludwig was involved. It's, it's that, yeah and more that they played it together. So in this case, I think we could not translate it as this and. But that would be a kind of uh, distortion of meaning. And instead, we just have to have our simple proposition, maybe, maybe we call it C. That simple claim. And then the way that we're going to translate this sentence right here would just be C, done. That's a non-propositional conjunction, a use of the word and that cannot be translated with an ampersand in logic, but that instead we just have to leave as a single letter. So that's, that's the decision making that you're doing when you're talking about propositional and non-propositional conjunctions. You're trying to decide, can I split this into two pieces of information, or am I really just getting one piece of information? And there's a whole exercise in the homework that's designed to give you some practice at this so you can kind of calibrate your understanding and making this judgment call. And that's the key thing. I'd say the, the, my best tip as a procedure here is you always want to try to break it up into a propositional conjunction. In other words, you want to try to make it into this, the ampersand version. But, and then if that seems like a distortion of meaning or something is getting lost, then you should go back and, and just leave it as a single propositional letter. That's, that's my advice for how to handle this problem. Try to break it up with, when you can. But when you can sort of hear, when you're double checking your answer, that that's involving a distortion of meaning, then you can't break it up. And you'll have to leave it as just a single single claim. So that's the wackiness to be paying attention to with conjunction. With disjunction, it's a, it's a similar story. We've, we've uh, talked about this one before. And that's why I brought back this little chart. Uh, it has to do with inclusive versus exclusive disjunction. I, I don't know if you remember what those terms stand for, but this was the uh, inclusive disjunction, the one that just uses the wedge. And then the other one that uses the wedge with the underline that I'm saying you cannot use, very important, you are not allowed to use the exclusive disjunction symbol. You don't want to do that. I mentioned that before, but I just want to remind you again. And instead, you'll have to translate it this way, uh, which might be hard to read here. So let me, uh, let me make it bigger again. It's got to be the P or Q, but and not both P and Q. This form, this logical expression, captures the exclusive disjunction. So that's exclusive. It's saying one or the other, but, which is really and, not both not both together. And that's what we get here from the truth table, right? At least one of them must be true, but it can't be both false value when it's both true. Okay? So with ors, the, here's the an annoying thing. In English, the word or and all of its various variations is always ambiguous about whether it's inclusive or exclusive. There's no way of telling just from the English. There's no mechanical way. Just like with and and non-propositional conjunctions, there's no uh, mechanical way of telling the difference. Same thing with inclusive versus exclusive ors. So you just have to ask yourself, pardon me, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so beat, tired, and sick. Uh, pardon me. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, 
you always have to ask yourself when you're whether this is inclusive or exclusive. And if there's a general guideline, I'd say it's to err on the side of calling something an inclusive disjunction rather than an exclusive one. And here's the reason. Uh, if you remember back when I was teaching the truth tables, I was talking about how uh, there's, I made these drawings, remember these drawings that looked like this? I was trying to demonstrate the kind of information that this operator, a claim that the, uses this operator is saying. And here's the thing. If, uh, oh, let's, uh, let's fill it off out again. So we had uh, quadrants for P being true and P being not true and Q being true and Q being not true, right? And uh, the thing about when you're, when you're just making the inclusive or, you're only ruling out this possibility, the possibility where they're both false. As long as at least one of them is true, the or statement is true. I mean, it could be any one of these three possibilities. But if you're making the exclusive or claim, then you're saying uh, not only can this not happen, you can't have both of them false, but you also can't have both of them true. So it's eliminating that possibility right there. Now that's significant because the more possibilities that are eliminated, the more false cases in the truth table effectively, the more information the statement is giving you. We were saying before that like <clears throat> or is saying something more than and, be, or saying less than and, because and is telling you this, right? It's like the real world has to be up here. But if you're just saying P or Q, then the real world could be any of these possibilities. Well, in a similar fashion, the exclusive or is a little more uh, informative than the inclusive one. There's less possibilities with exclusive versus inclusive. Okay? So, because the exclusive or is ruling things out more, it's giving more information. Now, how is this helpful? Well, it's my argument for why we should, you know, err on the side of inclusive. If you're translating or, generally you want to do it as inclusive rather than exclusive. Because to attribute the exclusive or to the speaker is to have them saying more, which is kind of like when we were doing, remember when we were doing argumentative reconstruction before, I was saying you want to avoid putting words in people's mouths that they don't, that they're not really saying. There was, there was kind of two sides of the boat that we could fall off on when we were putting things in a standard form and diagram, worrying about suppressed premises, reading into things, right? One side could be to never read into anything, in which case you're not even you're not picking up on implication, you're not worried about suppressed premises, and you miss the meaning of what someone is really saying. So that's one way you can err. But you can err on the other side of reading way too much into it, and then it's basically you making the argument rather than just diagramming the argument that somebody else has made. Same thing here. When we're doing this logical analysis, we're not trying to make our own arguments. We're just trying to diagram the arguments that we're given that other people are making. So we don't want to, and that might be ourselves too. I mean, we could be diagramming our own arguments. You can do that, definitely. But you want to be true to the thing that you're analyzing and not misrepresent it. You don't want to paint that portrait inaccurately. So the same thing's happening here when we're translating things into logic. We want to capture what is actually the content of what is being claimed. Um, and, to, or, and we want to be careful about putting words in people's mouths that they're not really saying. So that's why we'd err on the side of inclusive disjunction over exclusive. However, sometimes people are making the exclusive disjunction, and we got to be able to spot it when that's happening. So here's my advice. <clears throat> when you see an or, or something that's like or, all the other variations of or, try to listen and see, is the speaker, not you, the listener, but is the speaker are they trying to explicitly rule out the possibility that both of these things could happen, right? That one or the other of the, of the two things could happen here, right? One of the two things in the disjunction. That's what you're trying to listen for. It, are, is, one, are the, is the speaker intending to rule out basically this possibility right here, the case where they're both true, okay? That's the tricky thing. Oh, what am I, well, what's going on here? Where'd I go? There we go. Yeah, that's what you're listening for. If you don't hear the speaker deliberately trying to rule out the possibility of both, leave it as inclusive. That's my advice. So most of the time, the or statements should be inclusive, 
But every once in a while, someone is making the exclusive statement, and that's you got to listen for. Now, there's one uh, there's one specific case of, of or statements that the book talks quite a bit about, and I want to talk about too, uh, because it's definitely the trickiest case to look out for in making this judgment call about inclusive versus exclusive. So again, we're going to listen to see if the person's trying to specifically rule out the, the case of both. But these are uh, the the statements I have in mind here are unless statements. So here's a couple examples I really like. You won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. And another one here. The logs will make a nice campfire unless they are wet. All right. Here are two English sentences that both use this language of unless. And unless is really or. It's just or. But it's ambiguous whether it's inclusive or exclusive or that we're talking about. It's something or something else. But is it this or is it this? We have to decide. So let's let's go through and use our procedure for figuring this out. Okay, so um, the, this is not going to be quite as <clears throat> confusing as you might make it. And that's uh, there, there's some advice I have here about breaking it down and making this more manageable. I think if you're just trying to use your intuition here, it, it, you can get a little lost, um, with, especially when you've got a case like this first one where it's got a negation in it. So we want to be careful about that. Let's actually, um, let's be careful about it and when we break these things down. So first we got to make um, our universe of discourse. Let's call uh, W, we win, uh, I, or you, let's have you, you win the lottery. Let's keep the language of the original one. And then let's have B stand for you buy a ticket. Okay, those are the simple propositions that this is talking about. But in this case, we've got on the one hand, not winning. And then the, on the other part of this, unless, we have buying a ticket. Okay, so the two possibilities that the unless is holding together is not winning or buying. Okay, let's do, uh, while we're at it, let's just do the same step here with the second example. So again, unless is holding two things together. And let's make their universe of discourse. Uh, the first thing that they talk about is the logs making a nice campfire. So let's call that N for nice. It doesn't matter what letters you choose. It really doesn't. Uh, so the logs <clears throat> make a nice campfire. I can't type today. Oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, well. Uh, and then let's have W stand for uh, the logs are wet. Okay, there we go. So make... Uh, there we go. And in this case, the unless is holding together, you know, N on the one hand, not, logs make a nice campfire, and then on the other side, the W, the logs are wet. That's it. So N and W, over here we had not W and B uh, as the two things that the unless part is putting together. But it doesn't matter what these are. These could be really complicated. Remember, each of these uh, symbols is really a form for a whole type of stuff, right? This big string of symbols is really just a big and statement. It's just two chunks put together. Here, it's an unless with you know, the, the not W chunk and a B chunk. Here, it's an N and W, so that's a little simpler. But it doesn't really matter. You don't have to worry about that uh, when you're trying to figure out whether it's inclusive or exclusive. And here's here we just have to follow the pattern. So we know how to translate an inclusive disjunction. It'll look like P or Q. If it was going to be exclusive, we would translate it with the form uh, P or Q and not P and Q. Notice how similar these are. I mean, this one, you can put parentheses around it if you want. It's just, we usually drop them if there's no need for them. But see how they both start with this part. Really, the question between inclusive here and exclusive is about whether we need to add this but not both part or not. That's really the sticky part. Like I was saying uh, earlier, we're trying to listen for whether the speaker is deliberately ruling out the possibility of both. And if they're doing that, then we have to represent them as doing that. And that means tacking on this but not both part. 
So what would these two forms look like? Just the choices that we've got when we're talking about, uh, well, let's do the logs make a nice camper one. That'll be simpler. Then we just, you know, P is really N and Q is really W. So now we're looking at either N or W, or we're looking at um, N or W and not N and W, like that. It's really a choice between these two things. Now, let's say, you know, the big thing comes down to what happens when both parts are true. So is, is the English sentence here, just thinking about the English, if both these things happened, would this be a true statement? Would the logs, let's say the logs make a nice campfire and the logs are wet. If that happened, would the person who said this statement, would they have been saying something true or false? And again, there's no mechanical way to do this, but I think if you use your intuition, you'll get, you'll get the answer here. That if, if someone said, the logs will make a nice campfire unless they're wet, and I'm like, oh, okay, and then we start making up the camp, and we're like, okay, well, we've got to make a campfire with the logs. Oh, they're wet. But we made a campfire with them, and it was a nice campfire. Then that person would basically be eating crow, right? They, their statement was false. <clears throat> if the logs are wet and they make a nice campfire, well, that's what this person is saying can't happen. You know, they're trying to say the logs make a nice campfire unless they are wet, in which case they won't make a nice campfire. They can't both be wet and make a nice campfire simultaneously. So because the speaker in this situation is is got in the meaning of it that they're trying to rule out the possibility that both things happen, that you have a nice campfire with wet logs, that means that this cannot be the translation. And we do need to add the but not both. That's important. So this one, this one's an exclusive disjunction. So we're going to translate it that way. Okay. Now let's go back to this buying lottery or ticket sort of case. Now, if we were going to look at the options that we've got here, here, I'm going to erase this now. If we were going to look at our options for how to translate it, one of them would look like this, not W or B. That's the inclusive or version. The other one, though, would look like this, not W or B, and not the case, not W and B. See how that worked? See, we didn't have to mess around with the negation other than to just treat it as a chunk that needs to follow the same pattern. So if before, you know, it was just substituting N for P with the nice campfire thing. Now if it's not W, every time you see P in the form, you got to put a not W, and that's what we did there. Okay? So the thing that they're trying to say, if it was going to be exclusive, they're saying the thing that can't happen is not winning the lottery and buying a ticket. Okay, so if both of these two things happen, now, now we have to ask ourselves, is this statement true or false if the two things that the unless is holding together both happen? Let's say you don't win the lottery and you buy a ticket. Is the speaker trying to outlaw that possibility? Are they trying to rule that out? I'd say arguably not here if we consult our intuition. Someone says, you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. If you went and bought a ticket, didn't win, and went back and said, hey, what, what's the deal, man? They would have been like, hey, I didn't say that if you buy a ticket, you're definitely going to win. I just said if you don't win the lottery, um, if you don't buy a ticket, you won't win the lottery. That's basically what they're saying. Um, <clears throat> without buying a ticket, you won't win the lottery. That's what's happening here. They're not trying to say that both things must occur. Um, or that they can't, they can't happen. They, there's, there's, this advice is perfectly consistent with buying a ticket and not winning. So that means this use of unless, this use of or, has to be as the inclusive. So this would be a wrong translation. The speaker is not trying to rule out the possibility of both. So you have to put it like this. Now notice the way that I kind of was talking through the intuitions around this, in, um, this sentence. Uh, I was using a lot of if-then statements. I was talking about conditionals. And there is a way to talk about unless in terms of a conditional. Um, but I just don't want you to do it. Uh, the thing, here's, the, here's a funny thing about logic. This statement, P or Q, or actually, let's do it, let's do it the other way. 
is we're going to talk about P horseshoe Oh no, now it's too big. <laughs> oh no, all right. Here, let me fix this. Pardon me. All right, here we go. So if we're talking about uh, if P then Q, that's actually logically equivalent to not P or Q. These two things mean the same thing. And this is an interesting rule when you get on and do some more advanced logic because it basically means conditionals and disjunctions are interchangeable. So every OR statement can be expressed as a conditional. There's a way to do that in logic. There's a way to make this happen. It's just more confusing, and I strongly recommend that you don't do it this way. It's, it's harder to get an intuitive grasp on things using the conditional. And here's the reason why. A conditional only captures this inclusive OR. It doesn't capture an exclusive OR. So if you wanted to translate, uh, you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket, you could do that as either uh, W, B, or you could do it as not B, not W. And here I need to do, uh, we got to throw some, here we go. Right? So <clears throat> both of these would be acceptable ways of translating this unless statement. No problem. But that's just lucky because this one's an inclusive or. If you had the logs make a nice campfire unless they are wet, you could use a conditional to express that or too, but you'd still have to add the but not both part and that's where things might get confusing. Um, because there's a negation that's added or dropped when you make this transition, but there you're not um, you're not going to do the okay. Let me let me just walk you through it. I shouldn't have erased the nice campfire thing. Dang it. Okay, but you remember that problem. Okay, let's just get it up here again. All right. The logs, not capital. The logs will make a nice campfire. Let's just really spell it out so I'm not blathering. I'm still sick. I'm not sure how much sense I'm making. Uh, make a nice campfire unless they are wet. Okay, so we've got that sentence that we're trying to translate. There we go. Okay. And on the one hand here, we've got logs making a nice campfire. On the other hand, we have them being wet. Now, if we wanted to get this first part, the you know the equivalent of N or W, we'd have we could do that with conditionals, but we'd have to do it like um, like not n, then w, or alternatively we would do it as not w, n, like this. And again, let's get some horseshoes in there. Okay, so these are all equivalent. This is all good. This is all fine. Okay. This is kind of like saying, if the logs did not make a nice campfire, then they are wet. And this is saying, if the logs are not wet, then they'll make a nice campfire. Now, probably the, this last one is the one that might be most intuitively attractive as a way to translate this into a conditional. But because this is an exclusive or, this meaning right here only captures the same thing as saying, they'll make a nice campfire or they'll be wet because of the truth table for a conditional. Hey, you might even see how the would be plausible, right? With an or statement, all true, except for one case, with false. Same thing with the conditional, all true, except one case when it's false. So that's how you can kind of make them transition. But if we're going to get the but <clears throat> not n and w, this part right here also needs to be put onto these. And you might not catch that. It would have to look like this when we put it down here. If you're thinking of the two component parts as being not nice and wet, or not wet and nice, okay? But really, in order for the, these to be correct translations, they need to still have the but not both part. So I think it's always easier to just ask yourself. It's it's definitely you know the answer will always be one or the other. The only question is but not both of those things together. I think that's always the easiest way to approach all of these. So that's my advice for how to handle unless and how to handle or. And there we are with that.
Okay, now we got to talk about conditionals. And conditionals are a pain in the neck. Um, because there's so many different ways. Uh, like, yeah, here's some, let's talk about some introductory things about conditionals. There's so many ways that we express conditional relationships in English. And there's no way I can ever give you an exhaustive list of all of them. So there's, there's a technique I'm going to teach you. We're going to look at some paradigmatic examples. I'm going to write up on this on my little whiteboard here. And then I'm going to teach you a method that will allow you to figure out any conditional statement and how to translate it, no matter what version you got. All you got to first be able to do is hear that there's some sort of hypothetical claim going on, that there's sort of a what-if scenario that's happening. Because conditionals always have that, if something, then something else. Okay. And, and again, remember my lecture before, I was saying there's a lot of different types of conditionals. Philosophers have a lot of disagreement about how to capture them. Um, so all everything that I tell you here is with a big dose of salt. But if you, if your intuitions start frying, if you get really confused, if you don't feel like there's a strong intuitive answer, uh, in certain cases of conditionals, that's natural because there are things that are actually fuzzy that are not clear that we don't even have clear consensus in logic about. So that can happen. A lot. Of, some of those cases are a little rare. Certainly, you're not going to see any of these cases show up on the exam. I'll be very careful about that, uh, and, or in the homework, either. Uh, but um, the technique that I'm going to teach you is still, is still workable. Just you know, put it with that grain of salt. Recognize that this logic uh, rabbit hole goes a little deeper than what we're, what we're able to do uh, with this class. OK, so let me show you some examples here. I'm going to do them like this. <clears throat> I'm going to do, uh, let's do A, or if A, then B, C, if D, E, only if F, <clears throat> um, or uh, yeah, let's do this one too, if G, H, that's another thing that could show up. And then let's do um, I is sufficient. I don't think it has two Fs. No, it does. Huh. Or J. I'm a philosopher, not an English major. So my spelling is not so great. H, I, J, K is necessary for L. A little wider. <clears throat> and then we've got things like M is necessary and sufficient for N and O if and only if P. Okay. All right. And let's put these over here, actually. We're going to do some stuff over here. And, uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it like this. So here's a bunch of English sentences. And I'm going to show you some of the translations for how you handle them in the horseshoe. First thing we definitely have to acknowledge is that we have to be on our guard with conditionals. Because unlike all of the other logical operators we've got that glue two things together, the, um, the conditional is asymmetrical. It matters which thing is first and second because it has different truth values. What's, remember, I don't know if you remember these terms, but the antecedent and the consequent. Or the, the antecedent is the thing that comes first, the consequent is what comes later. So we have to be very careful about this. Getting the right order is super, super, super important. This is our standard one, if A then B. <clears throat> and that's just going to translate as this. Right? Uh, a, B. I need to find a... Uh, okay, I think I can do it. All right, there we go. So we have if A, then B, basic format there, no problem. Um, this version here, it, sometimes we leave out the N, if G, H. Sometimes we speak that way, and that shouldn't be too hard to figure out. Whoa, that's the wrong font. Let's go back. Oh, crap. Okay, let me fix this. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so if we got uh, G, um, uh, there we go, H. If we if we just leave out the then, it'll still be if G then H, or G horseshoe H. That's fine as a translation. 
um, if we have, sometimes we speak like this, C if D. And that would translate like this, D, gosh, it did it again. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I think I know how I can fix this for next time. But, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, this will go D, it should be bold, come on. D, C, D horseshoe, there we go. D horseshoe C uh, is how this should look. Um, C if D. You can notice a pattern here with the examples we've already looked at. Whatever follows the if is basically going to be the antecedent. So if A, A is first, then B. C if D, which is the same thing as basically saying if D then C. No problem there. If G, H, so G is going to go first. Now that pattern changes. What follows the if is not always the antecedent. If it's an only if, then it's different. What follows the only if will become <clears throat> the consequent in this case. So you'll actually see this. E horseshoe F. E only if F. Now, in order to explain this, I want to talk about the next ones here, sufficient and necessary. And I'm just going to give you uh, well, let's, let's do this. I'm going to show you the sun principle. Oh, no, I did it again. <laughs> uh, I forgot to fix that. Okay. <clears throat> There's an easy thing. I do. If I just do it, I won't mess up. Okay. Uh, it's, I call it the sun principle. And I didn't invent this. Other people invented it. But the sun principle is supposed to help you remember uh, what's going on with sufficient and necessary conditions and the conditional. So imagine the word sun, and then just change it, flip that U to be the horseshoe, and there you get like sun, right? What this is saying is that, and actually I want to, let's erase this, I want to draw a little bit here. I love drawing. The sun principle helped to remind you that the antecedent of a conditional is always a sufficient condition for the consequent. That's part of what saying if s then n is to say that s is sufficient. Or let, let's not use s and n because that's to try to remember the direction here. Let's go a, b. If a then b is saying a is sufficient for b. That's the same thing as saying if a then b. And it's also telling us that the consequent is a necessary condition for the antecedent. Both of those things are true. So saying if a then b, saying a is sufficient for b, and saying b is necessary for a all amount to the same thing. So let's let's put that in one kind of master sheet over here. If I'm saying P horseshoe Q, I'm saying a few things. I'm saying if P, then Q. Woo. I'm also saying P is sufficient for Q, and I'm saying Q is necessary for P. All of these are logically equivalent. They all mean the same thing. So that means if I is sufficient for J, then it's going to go I horseshoe J. There we go. And if we're saying K is necessary for L, then we're going to say L horseshoe K. All right? There we go. Because if K is necessary, then it goes in the necessary condition spot. All right. So this is really useful. This is the method that I was uh, mentioning a second ago is like the technique for how to handle all sorts of weird cases. If you are confused by only if, then here's how we might try to handle it. So uh, let's say, um, well, let's do, <laughs> this is kind of funny. We could use this. Um, you'll only win the lottery. Oh, let, let, let's put it this way. You'll win the lottery only if you buy a ticket. All right, that's actually the same thing as the, that's logically equivalent to the unless case we had before. Um, but you'll win the lottery only if you buy a ticket. And let's have win, win the lottery again is W and buy a ticket is B. So we're looking at W only if B. The first thing, if you're not sure, you know, you know this, this is a conditional, you know it's talking about something hypothetical. So you know it's got this goofy business going on here, but you're just you're not sure which thing gets on which side. Is it W horseshoe B or B horseshoe W? You're not sure. 
my advice is first, before doing that, before jumping to the symbols, instead, try to translate um, this English sentence into an equivalent English sentence, not even with symbols yet. Get an equivalent English sentence that uses necessary or sufficient condition talk, and then use the sun principle to figure out what's supposed to get on one side. So if they're saying, you'll win the lottery only if you buy the ticket, you know, if I had students here, I'd ask you to give me some suggestions here of what you think would work. Uh, but the thing that I think is the most natural sounding to our ears would be say, saying that the, the information the speaker's trying to give you here, buying it, oh no, I did the simple thing again. <laughs> All right. I think what the, the speaker, the information the speaker's saying translated into necessary sufficient condition talk would look like them saying that buying a ticket is a necessary condition to winning the lottery. In other words, if you're going to win the lottery, you have to buy a ticket. There's no winning the lottery without buying a ticket. It's a necessary condition. It must happen if you're going to win the lottery. And if we're saying buying a ticket's a necessary condition, well now the translation just got really trivial because I know buying a ticket's a necessary condition, it's got to go in the second spot. So winning the lottery will go first, and buying a ticket will go second, and there we go. Translation achieved. Okay? And this is a way that we can confirm that the only if has the pattern that I was saying it has. Now, uh, you might be wondering about just what does make, what does it mean to say something is a necessary or a sufficient condition? And these are, again, asymmetrical relationships. The book gives a bunch of great examples here. Um, I might use a, say a couple more things right now uh, in a video lecture. If I'm saying some A is necessary for B, I'm saying basically B doesn't happen. If I'm saying A is necessary for B, then I'm saying B doesn't happen without A. You gotta have A to have B. So that means if there is a B present and A is necessary for it, then I know that there must be an A. And that's why saying A is necessary for B would go into B horseshoe A. That's how it would work. So let, actually, let, let's walk that out again because I just talked it through. But it can be useful to see it. So by saying buying a ticket is a necessary condition to winning the lottery, I'm saying that this can't happen without this happening. So that means if this requires this to happen, if you see that this happened, if someone won the lottery, then you know that they bought a ticket, for sure, because you can't win the lottery without buying a ticket. That's the, that's the intuitive meaning of necessary. Something necessary for something else, that means that thing can't happen without the necessary condition being met. If we're saying something is a sufficient condition, then it's kind of like saying all it takes in order for something to happen is this. So, in other words, uh, cutting off my head is a sufficient condition for killing me. That's all it takes to kill Tim. Is that the only way he dies? No. It's not a necessary condition. It's just sufficient. It's a sufficient condition. That's all it would take. But there's other things that would be sufficient to kill me. I mean, if you hold me underwater for 20 minutes, I won't be dead if I don't have you know all other things being equal, no breathing mask or anything, right? If you just take me, submerge me underwater, submerge my head underwater 20 minutes, That'll kill me, too. I, I can't hold my breath for 20 minutes. I, no one can. I don't know. Has anyone ever done that? I can't. I definitely can't do it. So for Tim. Now, if I was Highlander, who famously can only die by beheading, any other thing will not kill him, then uh, it would be a necessary and a sufficient condition. right? Uh, and we'll talk about necessary and sufficient conditions in a little bit. But to say something is sufficient is not, to not say that this is needed for this thing to happen, but that it's all that it takes. That's all it takes for it to happen. So it'd be kind of like saying uh, here, if something is sufficient for something else, it'd be like, if you cut off Tim's head, then he will die. Cutting his head off is a sufficient condition for killing him. But if Tim is dead, does that mean that you know his head was cut off? No. And that again shows that conditionals are asymmetrical. If P then Q is not the same thing as if Q then P. Okay, so that's how we can handle uh, sufficient and necessary claims, but also how to double check on anything else. And there's a lot of weird, goofy problems that I highly recommend that you check out. Um, there's this other document I'm pulling up here. 
that's in uh, the module. It's called Extra Translations from Hurley Chapter 6. And this will give you some more practice at doing translations. And this is incidentally what I want to do some examples here when we get done with everything. Um, but you'll see a lot of conditionals in here. There's some really weird examples, by the way. I apologize for some of these. The person who wrote this logic book has a very strange imagination. Um, but there's a lot of weird things like implies that, given that. Um, th these are other ways to talk about um, conditional relationships or sufficient necessary condition relationships. And we'll talk about some of those in a second. But again, if you, if you can tell through your ear that there's some sort of hypothetical relationship taking place, so that means you know that there's a conditional happening, then you can try to use this method of translate things into necessary sufficient condition talk, and then use your sun principle. You just have to remember this simple sun principle to figure out which goes on which side. That's my main advice. Okay, so a couple more things to talk about here with regard to conditionals. We've got these other kind of combo things. So if we said like m is necessary and sufficient for n, what is this saying? Well, it's kind of like saying the uh, two things. It's like saying m, oh man, I thought I was going to be good about this, but I just keep forgetting to do the thing. Okay, all right. It's like saying m is necessary for n and m is sufficient for n. Okay? So there's like two sentences here, right? That are held together with and. So that means we probably are looking at a big and statement that's going to have, you know, a parenthetical here on one side and then a parenthetical here on the other side that's going to capture those other two claims. <clears throat> and then we can we can translate for these claims. Okay, so M is necessary for N. In order to do that, we've got M uh, M. Like that. Remember, if M is the necessary condition, it's got to go in the necessary condition spot, the second spot, and then the other one goes on the other side. And if we're saying M is sufficient, we're saying M... Oh, <laughs> Ah, it's so comical. Now we're saying M horseshoe N. If we're saying that it's in the sufficient condition spot. So there we go. So basically saying M is necessary and sufficient for N is saying if M then M and if M then N. I don't know if that makes sense auditorially, but good, t good job we can see it visually. I don't know if you remember this, but this is exactly like, oh man, okay, I'm just going to deal with it this time. Um, I can deal with the symbols this time. This is uh, just like saying um, M by conditional N, like that. Saying one then, if one then the other one, and then vice versa, both together, that's the by conditional. So when we um, come over here to fix this again, to m is necessary and sufficient for n, then we're going to have um, this sort of setup. Uh -huh. With the biconditional. There we go. Now, what about O if and only if p? Well, this is a similar sort of setup. If we've got O if and only if p. That's like saying O if p and O only if p. It's like saying both of those things together. Which again, we can translate into um, a big and statement. Right? We can treat this as like an and, where on the one side we've got O if p, which is like saying if p then O. Right? Oh, oh no. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then if we're looking at the other side, O only if P, that's like saying if O then P. Remember the little pattern we had up there? Okay. With the only if pattern, it would look like that. And again, this basically all boils down to P by conditional O. So um, that's what we're going to get. If O then P, and if P then O, that is basically 
this. All right, lovely. So now we've at the same time as dealing with the conditional figured out how to deal with the biconditional. And these are really the only, the if and only if and necessary and sufficient conditions. The only time you have to worry about these biconditionals because like I said in my lecture before, these are very rare. They don't happen all that often. Um, very rare. Mostly philosophers are talking in terms of biconditionals. Most of the claims we make are conditional statements, so they're going to kind of work like this. Okay, you can also kind of see in how I was handling these necessary and sufficient conditions or if and only if cases that um, it's got this kind of divide and conquer approach. We figure out the whole thing, it's really a big and statement, and then divide into the parts and work on those. And that's why I want to do some practice with you. And as we do some practice problems, we'll also deal with the final um, operator that I haven't given you any tips about, and that's the negation. So that's what we have left to do. So let's go through and do some problems together. Uh, these are extra homework problems, um, and we'll get some good practice here. Um, let's pull some up here and do them. Okay. And let's see, can I select some things? And maybe I can do some cool, cool stuff. I really like this problem because it's so difficult. But let's, let's actually not do that quite just yet. Okay. Let's do some simpler ones. And I'll make, a, make some room so we can kind of follow along and do, do some problems. Um, there we go. Okay. And let's do that. So I like these ones down here for figuring out how to deal with the negation. The biggest trouble, and I kind of talked about negations a little bit in the past, there's a big difference between this and this. Those do not mean the same thing. They do not. Uh, this would mean the same thing, or that, those things mean the same thing, but uh, this does not mean the same thing, and this does not mean the same thing. So distributing negations in parentheses doesn't work exactly the way that you might think it will. It's a little weird. So we're always trying to figure out what is the thing getting negated. Is it a big chunk, or is it just a single letter? What's going on here? So let's look at um, number 15. Not both Jaguar and Porsche make motorcycles. Again, we need a universe of discourse here. Let's call J, Jaguar makes motorcycles. Let's call P, Porsche makes motorcycles. So when it's saying that not both of them do it, then it's not that they're saying that they're both not doing it. It's saying that they're not both doing it, which means not. it's not the case that Jaguar and Porsche both make motorcycles. They're denying that they both do it. And that's why the negation has to go on the, on the outside. But when they say, say, number 19, neither Ferrari nor Maserati makes economy cars, if you're thinking about the information that the speaker is conveying, they're basically telling you that Ferrari and Maserati both don't do it. So if F stood for Ferrari makes economy cars and M stands for Maserati makes economy cars, then we would have to translate this as not F and not M. Okay? Ferrari doesn't do it, and guess what? Here's a second piece of information. Maserati doesn't do it either. When 16, when, when in 15, when they say not both Jaguar and Porsche make motorcycles, they're not giving you two pieces of information. They're actually just giving you one. They're denying that this state of affairs could happen where they both do it. Okay. All right, so this is the trickiness with negations. It's trying to decide what's getting negated here. But um, in the process of doing that, you kind of have to figure out what's the bigger thing. Is this a big not something, or is it something else? Okay. Um, oh, I also like to talk about this case. The, the neither nor thing is it's like not or, right? You know, it's what, how you might think about it. And this is, again, why I was saying, you know, you could, there is an acceptable answer here of saying it's not the case that at least one of them does make an economy car, right? So not or is, is a way to get the same information. I just think this is probably a little more intuitive. It's probably, if you're just thinking about what's the information the speaker is giving you, this might be the way that you'll try to capture it with logical symbols rather than this way. But both of these would be acceptable answers, full credit answers on the exam, as long as you give me an answer that's logically equivalent as the correct answer, I will accept it. 
it doesn't have to look exactly the same symbols. There's sometimes multiple ways to skin a cat here. Uh, but these are logically equivalent. They have the exact same meaning. So there might be a couple different ways to think about it. If in doubt, check with me. If you're thinking, oh, I can translate things this way, even though that isn't any of the ways that you saw happen uh, in my lecture today, uh, with this lecture, or uh, any of the problems in the book, then I would definitely say check with me before, just to make sure that your cleverness is really cleverness. Um, that, that's always my advice. Okay. Let's do some more difficult problems where we put everything together. And I think I'm, I kind of want to draw on this one, so let's see if I'm allowed to do this. Yay! We can do it. We can do it. We can make this happen. All right. So it looks a little weird. But I can make it look less weird. There we go. Let's make it a little bigger because I want to write all over it. There we go. So the Dixie Chicks opening the show implies that the Chili Peppers close it. Given that the Black Eyed Peas showing up implies that neither Gnarls Barkley nor Rascal Flats will perform. Well, that's really annoying. There's a lot of goofiness going on here that uh, we'd rather not be dealing with, huh? Um, it's pretty complicated. It might look like a scary problem, but uh, this, I like to do a scary problem because it kind of it's kind of like looking for the boogeyman under the bed. Once you look there and don't see it, then it's kind of like Hey, maybe it's not as bad as it might fear, fear that it is. Um, and dealing with these big problems, here's, here's always the rule with logic. No matter how big the expression is that you're giving a truth table for, or no matter how complicated the sentence that you're doing a translation for, logic is ultimately a matter of a bunch of very simple relationships, and you might just do a bunch of them together. But here's the thing. No logician, no logician relies on their intuition to handle logical calculations. Because at some point, your imagination fails you. Human, human intuition, human imagination is very finite. It can only hold so many variables at once. But logic's not dependent on that. Logic is more powerful than intuition and imagination in terms of the complexity of problems it can deal with. As long as you break everything down in a step-by-step -step way, you can tackle extremely difficult things without trying to hold it all in your head at the same time. And that's my main, main advice. Even with a simpler translation problem, one that's not so wild like this one, uh, even a really simple one, don't try to hold the whole thing in your head, in your imagination, in your intuition at once. Break it down. Break it down where you can. So, like I was saying earlier in this lecture, doing translations will really be a matter of going poles to parts, divide and conquer. Figure out what's holding the whole sentence together Figure out how to translate that form, and then work on the parts. Because most of these operators do that. Most of the operators are gluing together two smaller chunks, right? Even if it might be a letter or it might be a more complicated expression itself. But each of them is gluing something together. So if you can figure out what those parts are, then you can divide and conquer those things. And that's what we're going to see here in this really complicated thing. So the first thing we got to do, and I'm going to use a red. Is this red? Uh, no, that's not red. That's not what I want. Let's do red. Here we go. Yeah, red. Awesome. Little marker here. Uh, and let's do a. Let's get a brush. Yeah. Oh, that's much better. That's more visible. What is the thing in this sentence that holds the whole thing together? Some of these things, like implies that here, doesn't really hold the whole sentence together. The implies that only really puts this stuff about the Dixie, Dixie chicks together with the chili peppers. Um, or this implies that later on in the sentence just connects the black eyed peas and the gnarls Barkley Rascal Flats stuff. So I think the key thing that holds the whole thing together here is this given that. So you want to listen for that first. Figure what figure out what's what's gluing together the whole sentence that puts all the pieces together. Figure that out first. And then divide and conquer. Uh, so first we have to figure out how to deal with this. How, can we, how are we going to deal it given that? So imagine a sentence that just was like blah, 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 given that, blah, blah, blah. And actually, instead of blahs, let's call them A and Bs just to like be straight about it. So A given that B, how are we going to handle that in logic? What form would that have? 
A, given that B, let's let's try to, th I mean, I get the sense that it, given that, already has this kind of hypothetical character to it. So we're probably looking at a um, conditional, A given that B. But what goes first? So can we, let's use our technique. How can we, uh, A given that B, is that making a kind of necessary sufficient condition claim? And I think probably the most natural one here of all the options, because we could say like, okay, all the options are like, A is sufficient for B, A is necessary for B, B is sufficient for A, B is necessary for A. Of all the four of those, the one that kind of jumps out to me is the one that fits this the best is something like B is sufficient for A. Given B, you get A. B is all it takes to make an A happen. If that's the case, then we're looking at a B horseshoe A sort of situation. Oh no, I lost my thing again. Okay. Uh, oh well. We'll just do it the long way here. Okay. We're looking at another B horseshoe A situation. So A given that B, it's really going to be blah, 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 blah. Uh, or actually, sorry, we've got, because here's the A part's the first part. That's going to go second. So I know that in our master translation here, it's going to be a conditional, and it's going to have uh, a, a parentheses on one side. I don't know exactly how big this is going to be yet. So I'm just going to make it big just to be safe. Okay, like this. Let's get that together. We're going to have two parts. And the first part is actually going to go in the second part. So the first part of the sentence, if we're following the pattern down here, Dixie Chicks opening the show implies the chili peppers close that. That'll go over here. And then all this other business here, that'll go here. So let's focus on this first part. Dixie Chicks open the show implies chili peppers close that. Well, what's holding that whole thing together? You know, what's, what's gluing that together? And I think in this case, it's this implies that business. And A implies that B, what is that going to look like? Okay, so now we got to figure that out. A implies that B, hmm, that kind of says like A is sufficient for B. That's what kind of ring, that's how it rings to me. So that's going to look like this. A horseshoe B. So A implies that B means we've got another conditional on our hands that's going inside of this chunk. And I just got to get the thing on the right side. So Dix Dixie Chicks opening the show, if that's the A part, that's going to go first. Okay. Well, now, does that have any structure to it? Not really. It's just a simple proposition. Dixie Chicks open the show. Let's call that D for Dixie Chicks. And then Chili Peppers close it. That's going to go on the other side. That can't really be broken down. That doesn't have any more logical structure to it. It's just simple predicate, subject predicate thing. So let's call that C, Chili Peppers uh, close the show. All right, so we got that figured out. If D, then C covers this first part. Now we're done with that. Yay, we can forget all about it. And we've already covered this, so now we just need to figure out this chunk, which we decided earlier is going to go in this first part. Again, just divide and conquer, right? Divide and conquer. So now what's holding this thing together? Black Eyed Peas showing up implies that neither Gnarls, Barkley, nor Rascal Flats will perform. I think it's this implies that again. That's what's holding the whole thing together. The neither nor just does Gnarls, Barkley, Rascal Flats doesn't bring in Black Eyed Peas. But the implies that pulls the whole thing together. And we know how to deal with that. We know how to deal with the implies that thing because we just dealt with it here, that same pattern. It's going to be another conditional, okay? And then it's got to, it's going to go this thing, horseshoe this thing, second A part, then B part. And black eyed peas shows up. That's a simple proposition. Let's just call that B. Oh, <laughs> we made it green. Let's not do that. Let's keep it black. All right, there we go. B. Black eyed peas show up. If that happens. That implies that something else will occur. What's that? Neither Gnarl, Sparkly, nor Rascal Flats will perform. Now, we just talked about the neither nor situation. What's the information that the person's giving us here? Well, they're saying two things would happen. Gnarl, Sparkly would not perform. Neither would N Rascal Flats. So that's really like saying <coughs> it's not the case that Gnarl, Sparkly will perform, and it's not the case that Rascal Flats would. And that's another parenthetical that we got to put together that's hiding inside of this parenthetical. 
So it can get very complicated, but if you do the divide and conquer approach, you won't be confused about where the parentheticals go. And actually, we can clean this whole thing up now. Let's make it look all nice and pretty to get our final answer here. And D, C, there we go. And we got to put some horseshoes in there. Ding, ding, ding. There we go. And that's our answer. This is the final answer, people. Whole thing right here. Oh, let's have a no fill. There we go. That's our answer for how to handle this huge, complicated sentence. You will never have to deal with something that complicated on the exam. But there will be some tricky problems. And you will have to do the divide and conquer approach. And you'll have to maybe deal with some of these phrasings that are embedded in other phrasings. But if you, you, if, we, if you do it, if you look at what's holding the whole thing together, divide it into parts, and just handle one part at a time. Don't try to put the whole thing in your head all at once. Don't try to use shortcuts. I mean, just take it, take it piecemeal. Take one bite at a time. One bite, one bite. You'll get there. You'll be able to do it. It's, it's really, logic is just always a bunch of really simple calculations. We just do a bunch of them, and then it gets complicated. Um, but that's how that works. Uh, hopefully those practice problems helped um, lock this in for you, and I've addressed a lot of the uh, questions you might have about translations, a lot of tips and tricks here uh, to help you out. Um, I hope that is good help, and if it's not, let me know, and we can talk more about it, and I can answer more of your questions. Come to study sessions, uh, send me emails, call me, text me. Uh, this is a tricky se uh, section, and practice really makes perfect with logic. Um, this can't just be something that you're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. I'm ready for the exam. Let's do this. You definitely want the practice. You want to get good practice. That's why I've given you some extra problems for, that you can work from. If you've got questions about those extra problems and whether you're doing those right, I'm happy to answer those questions. But uh, practice makes perfect here, people. And, and uh, get help from me. Um, this is a tricky section. Tricky section. Kind of fun. Hopefully fun. If you like puzzles, I think you like it. Uh, logic, hopefully this gives you a little taste of logic too. Maybe you'll want to take some more formal logic classes in the future. Uh, I think they're definitely rewarding. Um, they're definitely a fun time. When I first started teaching uh, formal logic, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it because I was like, oh, it's going to be like teaching math. I don't really like to teach math. Uh, but um, here I am doing it, and I think it's a lot of fun. And when I teach the formal logic class, I have a blast with my students. So maybe you'll you'll find a, you have a taste for it too. Um, it, can, it can be really helpful with math, by the way. That's the final thing I would think I want to say to close off these lectures. Um, if you're someone who, you know, I've heard this phrase before, math phobic. If you're like, I'm not so good at math and you struggle with math, I recommend taking a little bit of logic. Even if you just look at some videos on YouTube or something, do some formal proofs or, or talk to me more about it. Um, studying logic really helps with math. I've had so many students come back to me and tell me that after taking a formal, a full formal logic class, that math became like way easier for them after that. That everything clicked. I think it might just be something about working with a symbol language, and logic is maybe a little more intuitive than math in the sense that we speak using logical forms every single second of every day. Uh, well, not every second, maybe not every second, but. Almost every hour of every day. Eh, maybe not that. But a lot. We do it a lot. <laughs> it's a part of logic, is, a, is part of the form of thought. Uh, so it's really uh, something intimate and familiar to us. Okay, I'll stop blathering. Thanks for making it through a long lecture here. Long lectures on logic. I hope it's helpful. Let me know how I can help you more. Have a good day.